uh, research shedding light on these two core systems. So the first uh, system, as I said, is the system for making sense of figuring out where we are in the environment. And I want to talk in particular about a strand of research that started maybe 25 years ago or so, uh, uh, work by Ken, uh, the psychologist Ken Cheng and Randy Gallistel uh, doing experiments on rats. And what they did in these experiments uh, was they took a rat who was hungry, put the rat in an enclosed environment, a rectangular cage that had uh, geometric patterns at its four corners, and showed the hungry rat uh, where there was food in one location in the cage, let's say over here, uh, which was partly buried but partly visible. And after the rat got to see the food, but before uh, he got to eat it, the rat was put inside an opaque box, spun around until he was disoriented, uh, and while he was being spun, the food was fully buried, or actually uh, meanly taken out of the environment altogether. So when he, when he uh, uh, is taken out of the box now, he can't see the food anymore. And the idea was that when the rat initially saw that food, he, went, he was hungry, so he'd be motivated to remember where it is. But now he's been spun around, so he needs to figure out first where he is, so that he then knows where to go and dig for it. And once he figures out where he is, where he digs should tell us what he knows about his own position. And what they found in this study was that rats were pretty good at digging at the correct location. They did that almost half the time. But the other place where they dug equally often was at the opposite corner of the room. This was initially very puzzling to them uh, because there were all these patterns and things that made those corners look very different, but then they realized there was one geometric property of the room uh, according to which those two corners were equal, and that was the shape of the overall environment. Those are the two corners that have a long wall on the left and a short wall on the right. Uh, and so this finding, together with a bunch of other studies they did, showed that rats are uh, reorienting themselves by representing this large-scale shape of the environment. Now, the fact that they didn't distinguish those corners also said that this initial representation did not include information about a, another kind of geometric information, information about those corner panels. And it raised the question, why? Is it just that the rats can't see those panels? Well, to address that question, Cheng and Gallistel did a final uh, uh, interesting experiment. What they did was they said, well, if the rats can't see these, pa these panels, we shouldn't be able to train them to use them. But if they can see them, then if we run this study again and again and again, eventually the rats should succeed. And that's in fact what happened. Eventually the rats got to the point where they only dug at the correct location. But I think the most interesting finding is they then went on to ask, how are they getting to that correct location? And they discovered that the, the rats did two different things about equally often on different trials. On about half the trials, as soon as they were let out of the box, they went to the correct location. On the other half the trials, they went directly to the wrong location, but when they got there, before starting to dig, they looked up and then made a U-turn and went back to the other place, okay? So the conclusion was that they're detecting the landmarks and they're learning to use them, but it seems to be through a separate process. These studies are providing evidence for two different processes, both dependent on geometry. One focused on the large-scale layout, the other focused on these small-scale patterns. Now, the same two processes exist in children. I'm going to go faster here uh, through research that we did, slavishly following the Cheng and Gallistel model. Uh, we made only a few tiny uh, modifications. We didn't starve the children. We didn't bury food. Uh, but we were mean. We took their favorite toy. We hid it in a corner of, an, of a perfectly rectangular room, uh, and then we spun them around until they were disoriented, and then <laughs> encouraged them to go find their toy and look to see where they would search. And we put other things in the room with distinctive geometrical and other properties that they could have used in principle to reorient themselves. Uh, and they failed to use them. They went to the two opposite corners, just like the rats do. By the way, I might say, uh, uh, echoing a point uh, that Brian Scholl made about instinct blindness, we did these studies because we were convinced they were going to come out the other way. We thought, we're going to find what's unique about human intelligence by showing that children don't make the errors that rats make, right? These were one-and-a-half-year-old children. I was convinced they were going to get this task right. 
they get it dead wrong and exactly in the same way that the rats do. Okay, um, we also were able to show uh, that uh, like the rats, the children can be induced to use a small scale object as a direct cue to, an, uh, to a hiding location. And you don't need to train them for days to show this, thank goodness. If you simply hide the favorite toy inside one of these two boxes, the kid will go uh, to the correct box. But you can also show that as they go to the correct box, they're not, in fact, reorienting themselves. They're not getting a sense of where they are that they could use to find other locations in the environment. So they seem to have the same two systems uh, that uh, the rats do, present and functional, at uh, a year and a half uh, of age. And you can show this, uh, s these two systems in work uh, all through uh, children's uh, childhood. Now, staying with children but going on to other questions, we can ask, what aspects of geometrical information do children use? This question is related to the question that Brian asked yesterday about representation of shapes. I need to think more about your spines. Uh, I won't be talking about them here. Uh, but we did see two different ways in which you could describe these rooms that children and rats were reorienting themselves in. One, you could describe them in terms of length and uh, distance. You could say the children are learning that their favorite toy is hidden in a corner that's got a long wall on the left. Right? Uh, or uh, in uh, a location, let's see, I should have put the arrow, I'm sorry, I, I messed this up. We've done these studies with a variety of different locations, including in a corner or at an arrow, uh, in, in the middle of a wall. If you do it in the middle of a wall, then you could find it if you uh, uh, represented it as being to the left of uh, a given corner. That's one way in which they could represent these rooms. Um, but these rooms also have a distinctive, what's sometimes called aspect ratio, that is a distinctive set of distance relationships. So if you're standing in the middle of one of these environments, you could represent the location of the object as being to the left of the more distant wall in the upper case, or to the left of uh, the more distant corner uh, in the bottom case. So what kind of information is being used in this situation? These are both geometrical descriptions. But is the relevant information about distance and direction, or is the relevant information about uh, length and angle? Well, you can distinguish these by doing experiments in fragmented rooms. So here are two rooms where we've taken away the distinctive length. These are all, of course, I hope this was obvious, being seen from above. The child is actually inside the rooms. You're just seeing an overhead view here. Um, the, uh, uh, these two rooms have no distinctive wall lengths. There are four walls, all of the same length and no distinctive corner angles, but they've got the same distinctive distances as the connected environments, and children succeed in these two cases. You can also do the symmetrical experiment of taking away the distinctive distances, but leaving two walls that are twice as long as the other two, or two corners that are twice or more as large as the other two, and now children fail. They learn um, that uh, something is in a corner, but they don't learn which corner. Okay? They don't use length and angle uh, to solve this task. So the relevant information is coming from uh, distance and uh, direction. Final thing we found that initially puzzled us, as does so much of what we learned in these studies, um, uh, we found that if you preserve the distance relationships and compare how well children do in a room that's got continuous walls but no corners, or a room that's got corners but no continuous walls, presenting the same amount of you know, surface in uh, both cases. They succeed in the first case and they fail in the second. Okay? So they're using extended surfaces, distance and direction from extended surfaces, but not corners. That's not entering into the uh, representation. So this looks like a very finicky, picky, quirky system, okay? And we can use those quirks to ask, first of all, um, do uh, we see evidence for this? Is this system unique to humans, or are we seeing evidence for the same quirks in other animals? And because I'm uh, running short on time, which alas, I always do, I won't actually take you through the details of these experiments. Let me just give you the results, and, and uh, if you have questions about them, we could uh, study it later. You can basically do the same experiments in fish, Zebrafish are interesting because you can do genetics on them, though to my knowledge nobody has done this yet. There's a, a study uh, waiting to be done. Um, and you can ask, do they rely on uh, distance, which you have here, or on surface length? 
And do they rely on continuous surfaces or do they uh, also rely on corners? And you see the same patterns of success and failure in the fish that you see in the humans. So it's not just that they have an ability that we also have, but it looks like the ability is depending on the same mechanism in them as it is in us. It's they're succeeding and failing under the same conditions uh, that the human um, uh, children are. So in summary, it looks like this is a system for uh, uh, navigating in relation to geometrical properties of the surface layout that's emerging early in children, that's widespread uh, across animals, and that's picky. Uh, relying on some, uh, functioning in some conditions, uh, but not others. Now, because this system is shared by humans and other animals, you can now use studies of animals to address fundamental questions about the nature of the human uh, mind. Uh, so, one question you can ask is, what's the effect of experience on the development of this system? Now, you can't test a human child until they're about a year and a half of age when they start walking around by themselves and navigating on their own. You also can't test an animal until they're able to walk around and navigate on their own, but you can control the experience that they have before that point. So you can take a fish or you can take a chick, this has been done in both species, and raise them in a purely circular environment where they never get access to any distinctive aspect ratios, distinctive distances, surfaces, corners. They have no experience of any of that. And then put them in a rectangular environment for the first time in their lives and ask, Will they use that rectangle, you know, the information in that rectangle the first time they're exposed to it? And the answer is yes, uh, they do. So this is a system that develops without experience. You can also do studies that probe the neural basis of this system. And there's a huge literature out there that I will only point to without talking about it at all that's exploited the fact that we see common brain systems uh, in humans and other animals like rats. Uh, to ask, first of all, what systems are necessary for this ability? Uh, if you knock out one or another brain system in a rat, what, what, what systems would uh, 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 lead to impairment uh, of these abilities? You discover that the hippocampus and surrounding cortex is very important if you do that. And then you can also look at individual neurons within those systems and do the kind of research that's been done on the visual system and ask, what kinds of information about the environment do those neurons care about? And guess what? You get the same answers as you get from the behavioral studies. They care about surface distance, they care about surface orientation, but not length and not uh, uh, corner angle. So from these studies, uh, we start to see how to take steps to understand how the brain is encoding uh, this information. But the geometric representations at work here cannot be all of Euclidean uh, geometry. Euclidean geometry applies to everything. These systems apply to a very limited set of things, right? Uh, only large-scale environments, only extended surfaces. And Euclidean geometry encompasses not only distance and direction, but length and angle, uh, and these systems don't. Fortunately, there's a second system of geometrical representation that I'm hardly going to talk about. Brian uh, talked about it. A system for representing the shapes of forms uh, and of objects. Let me very quickly uh, summarize what I think are the big conclusions from the vast research that's looked at this in human infants, in human adults, and in uh, non-human animals and their brains. First of all, we're super sensitive to angle in visual forms. If you take a baby, show them this angle, bore them with it, and then present them with either the same angle at a new orientation or the same two oriented lines forming a different angle and ask what's still boring and what's interesting? What's interesting is a change in angle. They detected that original angle and they remembered it. And similar studies show that babies detect length and remember that. But interestingly, they don't, in visual forms, detect these uh, left-right relationships that were so evident in the uh, reorientation tasks. Now, if you make tasks a little more complicated, and I won't go into this, you can do the same studies with older children and adults. You can do them in the US and you can do them in the Amazon. And when you do, you find that some ge the, the task here is find the form that's different from the others in each of these six arrays. And for some uh, geometric relationships, this is an easy task, and for some, it's hard. What's easy? It's easy to find an angle that differs from the others, or a set of length relations that differs from the others. What's hard is to find the relation that distinguishes a form from its mirror 
image. Uh, same as with uh, the infants. And finally, you see the same thing when you do studies of non-human animals from bees uh, to uh, pigeons to monkeys. Uh, and you see it when you do studies uh, that look